Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Laker Central. I'm Alex, and as always, that is Vinay. Make sure you guys uh, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications so you don't miss any of the Lakers content. Also, if you listen to this on Apple, Spotify, Google, or any podcast app, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. So what we're going to do uh, is have a little bit of a different show than we've been doing recently. You know, Lakers are 10 games in to this season. So we thought it'd be a, a good benchmark to take a look back at some of the things that have worked well for the Lakers and some of the things that might be trending in a, a negative direction that we should probably keep an eye on maybe for the next 10 games. So, um, but before we do that, Vinay, how you feeling after that uh, close Lakers win against the Bulls the other night? It, it seemed like their defense was better from the first game of the back-to-back. Um, so that was good. It wasn't good at the start because apparently Zach Levine decided to turn into Michael Jordan uh, and not miss a single shot in the first quarter. Uh, and so I thought that was sort of interesting. It's it's kind of getting it's getting spooky now, Alex. Uh, it seems like every time somebody comes to play Lakers, even when we don't have fans, they're mm-hmm. like auditioning for like a potential like you know like it's like they're auditioning for like the national audience. Um, we saw that with Lamarcus Aldridge. He's been in the league for a long time, but you know Levine is still a young guy. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought he played really well. But then the Lakers adjusted after the first quarter. Mm-hmm. And in the second half, they were much better defensively. So I'm glad that they won the game. Not quite happy the way they won the game because I thought they kind of started slacking off. But also Garrett Temple decided to start making a bunch of clutch threes at the end yeah. of the game. It's just it's just kind of the story, man. Like I, 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 maybe one or two games this season that have been outright blowouts where we've just kind of been able to coast in the fourth. But... It, that's what's just going to happen. Uh, we always forget that this, we're the Lakers and teams are always going to give us our best shot. Uh, I saw yesterday uh, um, a Rockets beat reporter saying that Christian Wood, because we're playing the Rockets tomorrow, mm-hmm. um, Christian Wood circled his calendar uh, for this Lakers matchup. So it's like, uh, all right, I, I mean, we didn't do anything to you, but oh, I, it's nice to know that you want to really play against us. But hey, man, we're, we're the big dogs. We're the We're the big sharks in the pond right now, so... That's just how it's going to go. We're getting everybody's best effort, man. I saw that same thing about Christian Wood, and I know we'll probably talk about that before pregame tomorrow or whatever, but sure. it, with no fans in the stands, that means that there are more eyes on you know on the games television-wise, and these guys mm-hmm. are coming out. And when the Lakers were bad, they circled the calendar when they played the Lakers. And now that we're good again, it just feels like it's this huge thing for them you know, regardless if they're auditioning for, you know, a new NBA contract or like they're trying to make a name for themselves and get endorsement deals or something because they dropped 40 on the Lakers or something. And now they're trending on social media. It's, it's just what it is, man. So I hope the Lakers come out with with a bit more energy. At least they can, hopefully they can hit some shots early on against the Rockets, but (laughs) nevertheless, um, I know fans out there, they've been up and down about the Lakers, even though the Lakers themselves, Seven and three, man. So, guys, what we're gonna do is like do two segments. Two segments. One, just the the positive things that Vinay and I have seen, and then the second segment, the, the things that aren't so great. And then we'll, we'll we might go to a different part of the conversation from there. But Vinay, since you graciously let me go first, the first thing yes. I wanted to point out, um, I wanted to be just really transparent and not get you know um, over wordy. Lakers fans, the Lakers are seven and three. First in the West. They're second in field goal percentage. They're sixth in three point shooting percentage. Like, for a team that couldn't hit the broad side of a barn last season, like, for as maybe up and down as we think the team has been for games like the other night against the Bulls, where Levine went off and the game was way too close, um, they're seven and three. And so I'm not going to say anything more than that for my first thing, except they are seven and three. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, really hard to complain. I mean, they have the second highest net rating um, of all the teams that are that have played. You know, basically everybody's played about eight, nine, or ten games by now. Um, second highest net rating. They have a top three offensive rating, and they have eighth all their defense. defenses is eighth on the defense. But obviously, we know it can improve. Um, the The defensive offense ratings, they'll get skewed very heavily because it's such a small sample size of games. Um, But it's good that their offense is doing – I mean, they're doing exactly what we expected them to do. Mm -hmm. They they got – they didn't get rid of them, but they didn't bring back a bunch of the defensive, you know, 
really strong defensive guys and they brought on some guys that are a little bit more two way, a little bit more on the offensive end, like yeah. Montrez and Schroeder. And that is exactly what is happening. Our offense is way better than it was last year. Uh, and that's with two games without Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis didn't play the Minnesota game and he didn't play last night either. So it's kind of good uh, that we're two and zero even without him this early in the season. And we've also not played with KCP uh, for mm -hmm. a couple of games. We missed Caruso for a couple of games. So it's kind of good. Um, so I fully agree with you. I know that how we win is important to Lakers fans because we're very diehard uh, about the, the nitty gritty details. Uh, but we're winning on talent alone right now. And we know that this coaching staff is not going to take that for granted. They're always working on small things uh, as, as the season continues. And look, man, uh, we've said it many times. It's it's this is preseason, pretty much. I don't know how much of it's going to be preseason, but to go seven and three through pretty much what seems like preseason basketball is pretty great. Uh, so I'm I'm with you there. Um, my one favorite thing, uh, or my first favorite thing, LeBron James looks like an MVP candidate yet again. Um, everybody was expecting LeBron to be the guy who coasts, uh, and to some degree, he probably has in different areas, maybe possessions of basketball defensively here and there he'll kind of take it easy which is kind of why we get a little upset because it's actually his man that's standing out on the perimeter hitting those open threes or whatever um but he's looked fantastic even even the chicago game he looked he looked fantastic uh the grizzlies second game the the san antonio second game it's just braun is just in takeover mode and i don't know about everybody else but it seems like he's making a conscious effort to take more mid-range shots just kind of within the flow of the game Last night, I thought he was like he was almost screwing around the way he was playing, like in the post. Like he was just having fun, just messing around. He'd hold the ball for like 23 seconds of a possession, or like 20 seconds of a possession in the post, and then he all of a sudden he decides to drive in the last four seconds and gets an easy layup. So LeBron James is an MVP candidate. So through these 10 games, and uh, it's hard for me to argue that he isn't the front runner at least right now, um, especially considering he's played two of those games without Anthony Davis. Um, I know they haven't necessarily played like the big dogs in the West uh, outside of maybe like the Clippers. Um, but we don't even know who the big dogs in the West are because teams are like teams like the Clippers are losing games to teams like the Warriors who yep. are, uh, people think are going to be like an eight seed. So who's the big dogs? But, you know, we don't know. Um, but they're doing their job and uh, they're winning these games uh, against competitive teams. And, and LeBron James has looked great. No, he has. I mean, it's funny. It's not surprising that some of the things you're mentioning I had written down as well. If he keeps up the, the level of play that he's at, one, he's playing the lowest minutes of his career. So that was going to be a big deal. But if he, you know, if he continues this thing, at the end of his Lakers contract, he may very well be able to retire a top 10 current player. And we, we traditionally don't think of guys when they retire at the end of their careers that they're still like an all-star level player. They're generally not yep. anymore. Yeah, his, 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 his go ahead. Go ahead. I oh, know I was gonna say like his like I what is the decline with this guy? I don't know. I I, I don't know what what did like this is the first time in my life like where I've watched a guy and I don't know how he's going to decline. Like what did what is that gonna look like? He's gonna start missing a bunch of jump shots because his jump shooting is getting better. Like he yep. seems like he's more confident shooting his long ball and just like if you watch that Chicago game, the way that he's dissecting the defense with the pass when he's in the post and stuff like that, like what is the version of this team that like what is this version of LeBron that's going to be like eventually fading off into the distance? He, and and I think you may be right. If he if he gets a sixth championship or whatever he does when he decides to retire, he may not retire as like a guy where you're like okay he's clearly declining, so he's getting out he's he's getting out before he, you know. Right. Uh, we can basically put him out to pasture. He may just be like, nah, I'm done with this now. Like, I've done this for 20 years, 25 years or whatever. And I'm, I'm cool. Like I can still put up 20 and 10 a night or 20 and eight a night. And I just, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm going to go do something else now. And that, that would be very Jordan like, because that's basically what Jordan did when he retired the first time. Well, and there are a lot of people that believe that he's, he's going to stick around long enough to get Kareem's record, assuming health, but yeah. along the ride of getting Kareem's record, if he happens to get there and pass Kareem in an all-time scoring, he may very well also either t tie or pass Kobe Bryant in championships with five or tie mm -hmm. or pass Michael Jordan with six. Um, so the next few years are, I mean, look, at this point, there's still very much a conversation with the greatest player is, and I would probably lean Michael. But 
if he gets the greatest scoring, if he, he gets this the scoring championship, um, all time point leader, and he passes mm-hmm. Kobe and Michael or ties them in championships, um, his argument will be as ironclad as as any. And look, you can't yep. argue against undefeated in the finals. I, no. I mean, you can't argue against that at all. Jordan was an animal. And I would argue that he probably would have played longer in this day and age had he had modern medication and all those different things. Yeah. Um, it's, the way athletes take care of their bodies is just different than um, what they yep. did in the 90s. I mean, he was smoking cigars and, and playing and gambling <laughs> until 2 in the morning before, before Bulls game. So it was a different different day. But, um, yeah, I was thinking about that. Just his, uh, I'm glad you brought up that point about you know how good he's looked because I think he's very clearly coasting, yet even yes. though he's coasting, he's averaging 25, 8, and 8. And yeah, it, it's, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 crazy to see him, and it's it, you know I, I hope you know Anthony Davis can get healthy and stuff like that, and, and kind of find his groove too, because I feel like some of these games that are close games would normally be blowouts if we were right. fully locked in the way that we want to be. So that's my first thing. So uh, what what do you you got uh, as your next thing? So that was one of my things. So I'm gonna go in a different direction and and talk about Dennis Schroeder and Montrezl Harrell. Um, okay. They have acclimated themselves to not only you know the, you know being on the Lakers, but just the Lakers culture like really really quickly. So one with Dennis Schroeder, he's been as good as advertised. He's probably been better defensively. I don't think anybody thought he was going to be this good defensively for the Lakers. Um, and then Montrez, he came up big last night. He had 17 and 14, I think. Um, he's not complaining about getting less shots. He's shooting, I think, four less shots a game this season. But his field goal percentage is higher on the Lakers than it was the Clippers last season. Mm-hmm. And so they've done a good job in bringing those guys in and those guys not worrying about contracts. I know you know they're going to negotiate something with Schroeder maybe in February. Trez obviously has a player option at the end of his. Um, but they've come in. There are no issues. Looks like they're playing hard. Um, they've bought into whatever the Lakers want them to do. And so I think that them coming in and just kind of buying into what things, how things go with the Lakers, has it's been great considering how little amount of time they've had a, had an opportunity to gel together. There's no off court stuff that they can do together. Oh, there is, but you know it's very limited, obviously. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so they've come in and just I think they've been, I think they've been as good as they could have been given the current situation and only ten games into the season. Yeah, you know Montrez. So yesterday was another game uh, where that. That was really good to see, just kind of the energy that he brings. Yep. Um, and I want to—I want to say the second game against San Antonio. It was also another game where he kind of overwhelmed San Antonio mm-hmm. through the through the course of the game, just with his like kind of ferocity and stuff like that. He played all twelve minutes. He played the entire fourth quarter um, of that game. So Lakers could have brought back Gasol at any point if they wanted to, but they didn't, and they let Montrez finish that game out. Obviously, if Anthony Davis was healthy, he'd probably eat some of those minutes too as well. But it was good to see that, at least in that situation, mm-hmm. against like a young team, a bunch of guys, like he was able to hold his own defensively. He had about, I would say he had two plays specifically. One, it was a pick and roll where he basically just took the switch on Zach Levine and was able to force a like a sort of fade away to which may be a shot that Z- Levine likes, but at least Montrez was able to kind of challenge it enough where he shorted it. And I think the one, the, the game winner or something like that was another one where Montrez like kind of uh, took that switch. And that's a wrinkle that we only get with Anthony Davis or Mark, Markeith Morris when they, when he's playing center, um, the ability to just switch. Mm-hmm. And I thought um, in the first half, um, Chicago was specifically targeting Gasol with the pick and pop stuff. Uh, and they did the same thing at the beginning of the second half of the game. And Gasol really struggled with just recovering in time. And that may just be because of age or just because of the matchup. But there's something to be said about like the the athleticism gap, obviously between Gasol and um, like younger guys like Willie Colley, uh not Willie Colley, sorry, um Wendell Carter Jr. is what mm-hmm. I was thinking of, uh, the, uh, the Chicago Bulls starting center. But when they switched Montrez on onto Wendell Carter Jr., Montrez was completely overwhelming him. He would put a, he'd dry, do a drop his shoulder hit. He had a play where he did the pump fake and uh, somebody jumped completely out of control and then he went baseline and he, and he and he scored on him or something like that. It was a really nice play, but. Stuff like that, you know, uh, is important. And I think Vogel, if this was a playoff situation, I actually wouldn't be surprised if somebody like uh, Montrez ended up starting, like if we had to play Chicago in a series, just because the athleticism is different. And he gives us a, a, a wrinkle of, hey, Montrez, take this switch and just don't let him get to the rim. And Montrez can do that uh, if that's what his instructions are. Uh, and the Lakers have a team that allows them to do stuff like that. So I, I think both of those guys have been really good. Schroeder had a tough two games uh, prior, like he, so scoring-wise. But he finally, he got loose. Like, he got a couple of those little, like, I 
you know, he beats his guy just off the straight up speed to the yeah. rim. And the moment he starts doing stuff like that, you could tell he's getting into a groove. So I thought it was good. And Montrez eats off of that. Every layup, it feels like that Schroeder misses out of that pick and roll. Montrez yeah. somehow gets the offensive rebound. So we just need we need him to keep to, to believe in himself and not settle for jump shots and and to get him to the rim. So I, I agree. I think those two guys have been really really good with their energy. Um, and Schroeder, even when he's not shooting well, like his defense has been really really great uh, when he when he gets caught on switches. So that's that's been pretty awesome. Um, they're doing their jobs. We just want them to keep doing it, you know, and, and not lose any confidence in doing it. So I definitely agree. Uh, my next thing that I have is um, is a, a Laker that we haven't gotten, we've seen the least amount of, um, Alex Caruso. And specifically, Alex Caruso is shooting 56% from three. Mm-hmm. What the hell is going on? Uh, he clearly worked on something in the offseason because, uh, you know, he's, he's only taken 16 of them. Uh, so he's taking about three a game for the five games that he's played. But he's hitting 50% of them. And that is that is a wrinkle that, like, that's directly a problem that he had last season that he's corrected. So, like, the same way teams would treat Rondo and they would leave him wide open because they're like, oh, we don't think you can make these threes. They were doing that to Caruso last season too. And yeah. now Caruso's hitting a, you know, a ridiculous amount of his threes. Now, obviously, that's not his thing. He's not just going to start chucking up threes every time he's open. He likes to still attack and set up plays for his teammates. But... We've got a guy now who can play like Avery Bradley type defense and hit a hit a three at a decent clip. From what we've seen in five games so far, um, that's pretty awesome. Uh, and you know, it, it's it's especially important considering the fact that we didn't have Contavious Caldwell Pope. So there's going to be lineup situations now where we've got guys where we can do different combinations of guys based on the type of defense we need. Do we need two aggressive? Like on ball physical guys. Okay, let's throw Wesley Matthews and Alex Caruso out there. They can still space the floor for this team the way that we need them to. Do we need like two speedy guys who can get around screens and stuff like that that are slithery? Okay, let's put Dennis Schroeder and uh, KCP out there. Or maybe we can mix and match people uh, or we can accommodate for each other when they're uh, unhealthy. But um, this is awesome. This is an awesome, awesome development out of uh, Caruso that he's shooting with confidence and he's making them at this ridiculous clip. Yep. It's great to have him back. It's it's great to have him back. I think he hit both of his both of his threes the other night against Chicago. Um, and he looked good. So my my one final good thing, um, I think, with this Lakers team is that they are seven and three despite Anthony Davis missing games, KCP missing games, Caruso missing games, lineup changes. The games, some of the games have been ugly, and they've went stretches where they couldn't score. But they mm-hmm. have been able to weather um, all the different things that have been thrown at them in this early season, and I think that that's a very positive thing to look at and to you, know, you kind of see how that works out long term for the rest of the season as they deal with other potential injuries or, or COVID stuff, you know, health and safety protocols. Just as they get more comfortable with each other, you know, they weathered the storm this early. Um, I think that bodes well for them long term this season. Yeah, I agree. And then my last thing is is pretty much um, it's about the coaching staff. It's like, you know, we've seen so many different lineup combinations so far this season with Kuzma starting. Um, and then last night with uh, Wes and Casey or uh, Wes and uh, uh, Schroeder starting together. Um, it's very clear that this uh, Vogel is still doing like this meritocracy style of um, like uh, lineup adjustments and stuff like that. He hasn't messed around with the starting lineups too much uh, outside of the, the injury case. But it's very clear that in the second half of games, uh, because Vogel knows this, you know, the restart to this season has been so strange and people had different energy levels from time to time, that he's playing guys that are productive. Uh, yeah. Last night, um, Kuzma didn't start, uh, but he, you know, and he's usually my barometer to see like of how it's very easy to tell by his body language whether mm-hmm. where he's at, you know, uh, if he's engaged or not. And last night, he was not engaged as a player. Like he hit his corner threes and stuff like that mm-hmm. off of LeBron's actions and stuff, which we expect him to do. But all the design cuts and stuff that they try to do for him, he passed out of all of it, like almost immediately. Uh, when he knew that he had no angle, he'd just give it up or he'd be looking around to somebody else to give it up. Um, he didn't try to force the issue, uh, which may or may not be a good thing. But like when we need buckets, we need guys to be aggressive, not to be afraid uh, of doing stuff, even if it does turn into a turnover or something like that for whatever reason. I mean, he just didn't have it. So what was the what was the result of that? Vogel only played him like a grand total of 16 minutes the entire game. 
he played a lot of minutes in the first half and played almost no minutes in the second half. And I don't know if it was his energy levels because it was a back-to-back or if he was just in a funk or whatever it was. But um, I didn't post anything on, on the timeline, but I, like, I was watching it now. I was getting frustrated. I was just like, like you're not going to try? Like You're not going to at least try to do something? <laughs> And so when I didn't see that, but I saw guys like Taylor Horton Tucker, like, you know, he was trying to get to the rim. Cruz was trying to get to the rim. They're trying to make something happen, uh, especially Mm -hmm. with the non-LeBron lineups. I was like, I get it, you know? Um, And some nights it's going to be somebody else. Some nights it may be Kuzma, some nights it may be somebody else. And um, my my last positive thing is that Vogel still looks at it that way. Vogel looks at this lineup and goes, look, you guys all got the money that you guys want. So I don't want to hear about nobody, you know, being worried about your contracts for the guys who could get them. But whoever's playing and whoever is here to play and brings it tonight, those are the guys that are going to play. And that, you know, we said before, even last season, that's a hallmark of a very, very good coach. Um, and plus, game to game, we don't know how defenses are going to try to attack the Lakers or, or defend the Lakers. So it may be a different guy every night. And last night, it was, you know, our, our, our smaller guards. Horton Tucker, Caruso, uh, and those guys uh, that, that did really well. And, and it was the guys like Markeith who, who feasted on on open threes and stuff like that that mm-hmm. they were generating for the team. Uh, and Montrez, too, as well. So um, I love it. I love the fact that our coaching staff still – there's no resting on your laurels. Like, oh, you helped us win a championship so that you're right. automatically allocated this many minutes. Like, no, well, this is we're all starting back at zero again this season. That's how this game works. Yeah, coaching staff has been pretty good this year, and I I like the idea of hey, like you help us win win a championship last season, but if you're not playing great this game or you're not engaged, next guy up. Like that's that's how it has to be in order to continue the you know for mm-hmm. the Lakers to have an opportunity to repeat this season. So let's kind of switch and now talk about some of the things that haven't looked so great for this Lakers team. Things that you know yes. fans and 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 you and I will take a a closer look at maybe another ten games from now. Um. What's jumped out at me on the defensive end? And let me first acknowledge they are eighth in, uh, in defense right now, defensive rating. Yes. That's great. But to me, they have looked a step slow. They've looked like um, they've struggled making the correct reads. Um, and I attribute that to a lack of, a, of an off season. It's the shortest off season in NBA history. I attribute that to having a bunch of new guys on the team that don't quite know what Frank Vogel wants to do. I attribute that to guys already being in and out of the lineup. So they do look slow, and they're they're struggling. I've seen a lot of miscues on defense, but somehow, some way, they still managed to be the eighth best defensive team in the NBA. And I think mm-hmm. that once once things start to come together, I think that those defensive miscues that we're seeing right now, some of the lack of engagement for stretches that we're you know we're seeing these teams that the Lakers should clearly be able to to blow out. These teams are getting mm-hmm. hot on the Lakers. Once they've worked through some of those issues, I think that they'll, you know, clearly that eighth seeded defense will end up being a top three defense or something like that. But defensively, they've they've looked out of whack this season. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I don't think there's a better way to say it than what you just said. They they seem like they're a step slow, and we, we see that with the rotations and stuff yep. like that at times. Um, against the Spurs, we saw it. You know, like Spurs were playing a speedy, spaced out offense and stuff like that for a lot of their games, or especially that third game. And there were many, many plays where the Lakers were just giving up wide open threes. Too many guys getting uh, magnetized by the ball and just, st- you know, getting tunnel vision, looking at the ball mm-hmm. on the offensive end, and forgetting that their guy that's standing behind them is, is moving around to get give his teammate a better shooting angle. And by the time he gets it, it's already too late for a closeout. So um, I think that is directly attributed to the fact that we have no training camp uh we these guys have probably not had any film sessions i wouldn't be surprised if they're doing like no film sessions whatsoever like they're just going game to game and they're just playing their games and winning off the strength of talent um and they're not getting like even the scouts right like the scouts can't um typically what the lakers do is they'll send their advanced scouts out uh for matchups in advance like they'll send them right those are okay go watch this houston game obviously you can still watch it on tv but it's just like there's still a routine of getting synthesizing that information sitting down with the team saying hey look this is what this team likes to do uh this is what we need to take away and then we can we can naturally function out of this so they can't even do it like that right now they're, because they're all quarantining and they don't get contact to each other and i don't even know how you would set that up because you got to give these guys time to spend with their family they're playing right. four games in seven days so like it's it's very difficult um 
and we keep going on the road. So we know, you know, that COVID protocol is a big pain in the ass and stuff like that. Um, so I agree. I think the rotations have been really slow. Um, the one thing that I think I do not like, uh, or that's been a negative trend, but I think it's a negative trend um, because teams are still catching up to us, uh, or they they're they're playing us based on our lineups from last season. Um, is our pick and pop. So against stretch fives, I think our defense has been really bad. Uh, the Lakers have struggled against stretch fives. Um, obviously, we know that we have the ultimate stretch five uh, in the NBA and Anthony Davis. Um, and we know that he's not going to be chasing guys around right now uh, when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, he's still recovering from whatever his foot injury was. Now he has an adductor strain and stuff like that that he's working on. So clearly his body is kind of up and down uh, right now. Uh, but specifically, the teams that we've had difficulty defending are teams that have guys who can make jump shots from the five spot. So at the start of the Chicago game, Wendell Carter Jr. was giving us a lot of problems because Gasol couldn't recover on him. Um, in the third Spurs game with LaMarcus Aldridge, Aldridge was a problem because he would just take wide open threes at the top of the, you know, in transition or something like that. Um, against the Clippers, even though it was opening night, Serge Ibaka gave the Lakers problems because he was a pick and pop threat. He would take wide open threes or take jumpers and stuff like that. So my theory is, is that teams remember what the Lakers did last season. And they realize that we're not going to win this game attacking these guys at the rim, at least not early on, because these guys know how to defend the rim and they're not going to give us those shots. So teams are opening up games with stretch fives against us. Um, either on purpose or because it's part of the rotation. And it's hurting the Lakers because the Lakers' identity is we're not going to give you shots at the rim. Um, and teams are like, okay, that's fine. We're just going to take a whole bunch of threes from out here. And what's hurt the Lakers is that these guys are making their, their their threes. Now, if this was a playoff situation and we're playing the Clippers or we're playing the Spurs or we're playing the Bulls, I don't think Gasol starts those games. I think Frank Vogel does exactly what he did in the playoffs. And he says, okay, this is not a good matchup. It's actually a better matchup to pair – Gasol against the big plotting big that you guys have that comes off the bench. Mm -hmm. And so instead we're going to either start Anthony Davis or we're going to start Marquise Morris, somebody who can stand out and chase you, chase your five off the, off the three uh, on the perimeter while still being a good box out guy on the defensive end and stuff like that. So it's been a concern for me, but I also think the reason why that's happening is because people saw, watch the Lakers in the playoffs in the bubble. And they're like, Holy shit, you're not going to make anything on this team. Uh, if you try to go to the rim uh, with your big. So, like take take the three, and I think that's what teams are doing, and I think it's frustrating us um, as fans because we're like, oh, how how come how come the Lakers aren't recovering or adjusting to this? Right. It's the regular season; they're not going to do it. You know, they're not going to deviate from their regular rotations for a, a random game against Chicago or the third game against the Spurs mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. And I think that is um, connected to what you were mentioning, which is why they're they're slow on rotations at times. Because, you know, once you have one point of failure, uh, especially on the defensive end, there's always multiple points of failures that follow if nobody recovers correctly. So one of the things that I've looked at that's kind of – that's bugging me a little bit about this team. And so I talk about the defense first, and this part's on the offensive end. Now, again, they're like number two in net rating and a top three <laughs> offense. So, you know, we're, we're nitpicking here. But uh, they have these stretches, man, where they can't score. And last mm -hmm. year we saw that happen, and like we could have predicted that last season because everything ran through LeBron and Anthony Davis. We thought Kuz might be the third option, but you know he wasn't quite ready to be that. Um, and they didn't really have another guy. Well, this season you've got Montrez and you've got Schroeder, but still they seem to have these stretches where they can't get a basket. Or not only could they, you know, not just simply score, but they're struggling with their offensive sets, and you know they look to the isolation to bail them out. Look, you've got LeBron and Anthony Davis. You're going to do a lot of isolation. That's just kind of how things go. But I would like to see them run more pick and roll, at least early yeah. on in the season, man, until, you know, all the new guys get, get accustomed to what Frank Vogel wants to do, until everybody is fully engaged. When you have LeBron James, Anthony Davis, uh, Dennis Schroeder, and Montrezl Harrell, pick and roll should, should be a significant part of your offense, at least early on until everybody knows mm -hmm. what they want to do. There's those four guys should not be able to be defended. Um, once they get rolling in the pick and roll. And we're not seeing a lot of that. We didn't see it last year. Now we know mm -hmm. last year Vogel wanted to hold some of this stuff, you know, until the playoffs and finals. I, I get that. Um, but I'd like to see them just run what might be the 
easiest, simplest play in all of basketball history outside of isolation and run some pick yep. and roll. And one thing that did jump out at me, uh, let me look at my notes here. So when they run the pick and roll, the roll man scores 57% of the time. That's seventh yep. best in the NBA, man. Yep. Yet they don't they don't run it they, they don't run it nearly to clip of some of the other teams. So I'd like to see more of that. Yeah. Um I'm I'm looking at the play type data for um just based on teams, just for the, the pick and roll ball handler and stuff like that right now. Um and yeah, the Lakers are let's see, we got the the top pick and roll teams through ten games in terms of possessions, like frequency yep. of how often they run it, um is in volume is Bulls, Jazz, Magic, Nets, Clippers, Hawks, Knicks, Pistons, Blazers, Mavs, Grizzlies, and then the Lakers. So the Lakers are like outside of the top 10 uh, in terms of pick and roll. Um, their efficiency has not been that good. Uh, and it's probably also because they just don't run it or they're running it with like the wrong combinations or right. when it's like too late and stuff like that. Um, but this is specifically as it relates to like the ball handler, not necessarily the role man. So I'll, right. I'll pull that up in a second. But I agree with you. Um, it was something that I mentioned in uh, what's it called the the game against Chicago, where I thought that they were like trying to run like these um, three man weave sets and stuff like mm-hmm. that in half court, and it was cool, but it's like it's too much. Like it's too much. Like you're, I mean, uh, and especially in the sense that like when you run that against a team that's just going to switch everything because that's the easiest defense for them to play when these kind of misdirection kind of sets and motion sets come in. Um, that you have to simplify the game it's it's you know i was also kind of watching the 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 um this game at the same time the warriors game it's like something that i've noticed with the warriors too like if you're gonna run all that complicated motion stuff you have to play guys that are really smart when it comes to that because they find the open guy and it's right. not that the laker guys aren't smart it's just they're not there yet mm-hmm. you know i like you can't run three man weaves and stuff like that with taylor horton tucker caruso montrez West Matthews and like Kuzma, right? Like right. those guys don't know how to run that kind of stuff. The easiest thing to do is just let Taylor Horton Tucker and Montrez run pick and roll and let these other guys just play off of it and see how it naturally does. And there was a point in that game yesterday against Chicago where they did that. They just said, all right, just run pick and roll every single time. And yep. Tucker got a bunch of layups. Uh, Montrez it. got, a, yeah, just got a bunch of uh, putbacks and stuff like that. And so, you know, like I agree with you. Um, even when I look at the possession data for the, the roll man, um, for pick and roll. Um, it looks like the Lakers are outside of the top 10 also. Like they're, they're not. Yeah. 18th. They're yeah. 18. There you go. Uh, but they're much higher in terms of their conversion percentage. Uh, right. True to what you were saying, uh, what their true, true shooting percentage has been or whatever. Um, their effective field goal percentage as a roll man is 63%, which is really good um, out of that possession. So yes, run more pick and roll. And give it to Montrez when you run pick and roll because good things are happening when that happens. Um, and I agree with you. I think when it's like the non-LeBron stuff and the non-AD stuff, um, it would behoove them, even mm-hmm. when LeBron and AD are on, the, are on the floor, to run that and let those guys load manage while they play basketball uh, yep. on the floor. And um, hopefully they can they can get a little bit more acclimated to simplifying their offense when they need to, especially against a team like the Bulls. You don't have to run complicated stuff against them. Just, Mm-mm. you know, use your natural talent and abilities. And uh, we've seen that Montrez can do it. If he gets enough touches, like, it, sure, he may have a couple a couple plays where he gets blocked and stuff like that, or he turns it over. Um, but in the long run, it usually turns out to pretty good stuff. And so uh, I agree with you there. What's, so I would um, say, what's up that you've seen? Yeah, so, so I would say... Um, I, w- I would say that... I wouldn't say I'm, I'm the number one... Kyle Kuzma defender on Lakers Twitter uh, because I know there's a lot of hardcore stands that believe in him, but I would say I'm a positive advocator for mm-hmm. him to be uh, a successful player and that we just need him to play the role that he's playing. Yep. But I will say that one of the negative trends that I have seen is uh, something that I measure him on more than I measure his offensive ability. I, me- I measure his defensive ability. And specifically, I measure his consistency when it comes to his defensive ability. And one of the, not negative trends, but one of the trends I would like to see him improve on is his defensive consistency. Um, I know a lot of times he gets matched up against guys that are going to overwhelm him. But at some point, I think Kuzma has to start taking some of this stuff personally. Like, you can't want to go into games and just be like, I'm just going to do my best to try and defend them and do what I'm told to do. 
like at some point you have to take it personally like look f this i'm not going to let this guy score on me i don't care like what he thinks he can do or how he can draw fouls and stuff like that and that's something that i have not seen out of kyle kuzma that i need to see look i understand that you're going to have some games where you only get five shots and you only score six points like against you know against the bulls you made two corner threes when we need you to make two corner threes. You're, he hit that corner three that gave us the lead, I think, at the half or something like that, uh, or it closed the gap or something uh, last game. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's great. You, you step up when you need I, – I get it that your offense is hot and cold, and he is what I like to call a positive feedback loop player, where if you don't involve him in the offense, he's going to get more and more disengaged on that end. And then when you actually need him to do something, he won't he, like he won't come through for you. So I get that. But that's offense. You've gotten paid. You've got your championship. I need you to lock in on defense, man. And that is one of the things that I need to see out of this guy because for as much as I've advocated that he can be better um, and that I think he has all the tools to be better, he has to believe that in himself too as well. And I think that if he is more engaged on the defensive end, it will help his offense because he will get into a rhythm and flow uh, within like the course of the game. Uh, yeah. It is something that I've seen like with Wes Matthews too as well. Like, Wes, because Wes is so active on the defensive end, he's already like warmed up for the offensive end, even if all he's getting is catch and shoot opportunities and stuff like that. Like his muscles are more activated and his like brain is more active and stuff like that because he's like Mm -hmm. very entrenched into his defensive matchup. And I need Kyle Kuzma to get to that point where I know he's not going to lock somebody down, but I need him to like get into a stance. I need him not to like have like not to have a bad defensive stance and be like waving his arms like he's like the wacky inflatable <laughs> guy uh, from family guy you know what i mean like and that's the part that's that's making um like you I, i'm not like obviously I, I make my jokes and stuff like that on the timeline when he plays well and i it's purely do that just because i know there's so many people who don't like kuzma so i just do it just to mess with them um not because i think like he's you know he's like some crazy diamond in the rough but there are things that he needs to improve on that has nothing to do with his offense. And it's going to be on the defensive end. And I need to, I need to see him take these matchups personally, because then I don't know like how we fit you in. Like clearly you're a good stretch forward and stuff like that. And you know how to play around LeBron and you're not going to complain about shots and stuff like that. So I love that. I love that he buys in on the offensive side when he does. I love that he's not trying to overdo too much when it comes to that sort of stuff. And we may get games like in Chicago where we needed him to kind of, overdo it but he did it mm-hmm. and it's like all right that's fine but on the defensive end i need you to lock in man like i i, I need him I, I thought last season there was a point where um we could actually look at him and say all right i could at least trust this guy to keep a body in front of him and he's still doing that this season but it seems like he's like unsure of himself like his body language defensively is not good and i need him to lock in on that end um and i think the only way that he can do that is if he tells himself every single game the same way Wes Matthews did, the same way Avery Bradley did, probably the same way Alex Caruso does. I'm not going to let this guy get easy buckets on me. Uh, I don't care about my offense. I'm just not going to let this guy get easy buckets on me. And I think if he takes that approach, his minutes would go up. And, you know, we won't see a situation like the Chicago game where he gets, like, no minutes in the second half um, because he's he's affecting the game defensively. And he's got the physical skills to do it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I just don't know if he has – I need him to to get into it mentally uh to to allow him to do it well if he doesn't he'll be on the first trade rumor out of here you know i mean i just the the lakers are playing too too much of an important basketball stretch you know coming off the championship and then looking forward with lebron anthony davis's careers and everybody else that signed up um for them to have guys that aren't bought in so um so the last thing that i have that that's kind of annoyed me is again with the offense and guys yes they have like one of the best offensive rating in the NBA. <laughs> but the crazy part is, I, I know Vinay knows this too, and it's specifically with offense and defense. They could be so much better on both ends of the ball. It's crazy. So we've I, we've said it a million times. The floor for this team, the ceiling for this team is nuts. But um, I mentioned the pick and roll already. I'm going to go with Marc Gasol, and I think that they're not running enough of the offense through Gasol. Like, you've got um, Caruso and Kuzma, who you just spoke about, you know, Kuzma obviously worries about his offense, right? Well, those two guys, Kuzma and Caruso, are pretty good cutters. Marcus yeah. is pretty good at finding cutters or at least leading you into the cut into an easy basket. Right. I think the Lakers would 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 serve themselves well if they would they would run more of the offense through through Marcus I see 
this might come off the wrong way. I see LeBron handling the ball too much, which probably sounds ridiculous. But Fair. LeBron handles the ball a lot. Schroeder handles the ball a lot. When THT gets in, he dribbles a ton. And I'm like, they could get a few easy baskets sometimes, maybe to stop the other team's run or to maybe help mm-hmm. a guy get in rhythm. Run a few plays through Marcus All and, and let have guys just cut. I mean, mm-hmm. again, we don't need to run all these 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 crazy motion offenses. Pick and roll, cut to the basket, hit your open shots until the team starts to figure out exactly what they want to do. They need to utilize Gasol a bit more on the offensive end, man. Yeah, yeah, I I think that's fair. Um, I I think we have high IQ, dynamic kind of playmakers um, or passers that that could definitely help it out. Um, I'm I'm actually surprised after that Minnesota game where they were just letting Gasol just pick apart the team like with his passing. I have no idea why they've. Ne- I I don't think I've seen it like since then. It's it's especially with Anthony it's the same Davis thing out in preseason, right? It's the same What'd thing that happened in preseason. Yeah. Yep. It's it. I, I don't know. Maybe that's maybe Vogel's the, keeping it in his back pocket. But that's my point. The Minnesota grant game is a great a, a great thing to look at. AD was out. They ran a, a good portion of the offense through Gasol, and he had like what do you have eight assists, nine assists, or something that game? Like he was carving yeah. them up, and then he started hitting threes. Yeah. When AD is out specifically, why not run a little at, a little bit through him? That you know. But that that was that was the final thing that I said that would might help their offense. You know, get some easy baskets sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, so the last thing that I have going in, you know, looking at the other side of the basketball, you've been looking at the offense. Um, and so mine, mine will continue on the theme of the defensive end is um, 80s comments about the team locking in on the defensive end. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not really a, a, a grief that I have with it, but just, uh, Hey, we got to look at the mirror here uh, a little bit. Um, I know that 80 wants it, wants them to communicate better and lock in on the defensive end, but he's got to also do the same. Um, I agree. I, I think this Lakers team has done uh, a good enough job, even with the lack of, um, even with the lack of training camp and cohesion and and film stuff that they've been able to watch. And I understand that AD is the defensive leader of this team. He is the he is the voice. He's the guy who's like taking it upon himself to be the guy to let this team know, hey, we need to lock in on the defensive end if we really want to win a championship. But at the same time, that kind of starts with you, buddy. Uh, And there have been many, many times. Uh, throughout these 10 games where he's not been in position to help his teammates out. Uh, there have been times where um, their player, you know, like the guy on the perimeter is, is trying to send his, his assignment to corral him and send him into Anthony Davis to mm-hmm. help defend. But Anthony Davis is not there. Uh, and so that's why some of those wide open uh, layups are, 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 are showing up and stuff like that. And guys, it looks like guys are getting blown by. Right. So um, against like Dallas, you're looking at Kuzma playing um, Luca on, on the perimeter, and you're like, "Wow, look at Luca just blow by Kuzma uh, on the top." But what we don't, what we have to understand is that the Lakers are putting Kuzma on um, Luca because they don't want him taking threes, step back threes. Right. And I know he's not shooting very well right now, but like the whole point of the game is uh, Dallas plays an offense that's centralized on one guy, uh, and so the Lakers want to wear that guy down and make him come into our, you know the land of trees and, and wear him down. And so Kuz was doing his job. He's, he's playing high up on that step back three. So Luca has no option but to drive. But if nobody's there, right, if AD's not recovering in time or if he's just lazy about it or whatever mm-hmm. it is, um, if he takes time off on the play from possession to possession, Luca's going to get a layup. And guess who gets blamed for it? It's going to be Kuzma. It's not going to be AD. And so that, that kind of stuff is the stuff that we have to, um, I think this team has to hold accountability and it's not like a like a hard conversation of like right. oh hey man you're not doing your job it's just that i i think if they if they had film sessions which i genuinely don't think they're getting consistently it, somebody like in the film session could point out hey look ad kuzma did his job he sent this guy down we need you to be there you know like it's as simple as that and so um he's very i would say more than lebron probably he's been coasting but he was also injured um the yeah. same game that he had that bruised heel he actually i only i couldn't find the replay it was when he was wearing the championship um, Kobe's or whatever, the game that they lost, the game five or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like he had a really nasty ankle sprain on a drive attempt uh, baseline on his left foot. And um, that looked like a the way he turned his ankle on that looked like he'd be out for like two months kind of ankle sprain. And the fact that we only had a 70-day 70, 70 turnaround, mm-hmm. like I, I get why. Maybe he's a little uh, lackadaisical. So um, I like the public commentary about keeping the team accountable defensively. Uh 
but we also know what we're watching. <laughs> we know who's not uh, at the rim that when we need him to yep. be at the rim when we're, everybody's doing their rotation. So um, it's not really a negative thing. It's just a matter of like, I hope everybody knows that it's not just one guy, you know, like it, it's defense. Um, it is a five man thing. And the moment you get a single point of failure, the other four have to mitigate it or else it's all going to, there's going to be multiple points of failure. And um, that's kind of what the theme has been with this defense uh, so far, but I, it, they can improve, you know, they're, they're mm-hmm. still, they still have a net rating of eight um, out of all the teams in the league. And their offense has been so good that, they're still like one of the highest net rating teams in the league. So um, imagine how good they would be if they were really locked in on the defensive end uh, against some of these teams. So I agree. Once they, yeah. Once they get together, they, they will be scary. I, um, uh, a guy named the shard who covers the Rockets. Yeah. He tweeted the other day that, you know, this, this, the West is wide open this season. And so I, I talked to him and I was just like, the West is not wide open. Like the Lakers are clearly <laughs> the favorites. And he yeah. said, um, you know, well, they're not unbeatable. Like, they're the favorites, but not unbeatable. Well, look, things happen, obviously, that can derail a championship. But, like, For sure. the West is not wide open. The Lakers are the best team in the West. They're likely the best team in the NBA. And just because they've started off, you know, with a couple guys out or AD doesn't, he looks a little disinterested at times or whatever. Like, they will be fine. And you look at their next 10 games, Rockets, Rockets, Thunder, Pelicans, Warriors, Bucks. Bulls, Cavaliers, 76ers, and the Pistons. So the the thing about this will be what's going to happen with COVID um, because mm-hmm. the, the league at this point, you know, we had the bubble last season, and now they're dealing with the uh, with Jason Tatum, which just announced out. And uh, let me read this to you, Benet, because I know you wanted to touch on this COVID thing. So let's take a few minutes and just touch on it. I saw this. This is from Justin Russo. He covers the Clippers. Um, mm-hmm. So... This The contact tracing thing with all these guys being out. This is what he said. December 29th, Wizards play Bulls. December 31st, four Bulls players have to quarantine. December 31st, Wizards play the Bulls again. Then, January 3rd, Wizards play the Nets. January 5th, Kevin Durant has to quarantine. January 6th, Wizards play 76ers. January 7th, several 76ers players have to quarantine. January 8th, the Wizards play the Celtics. January 9th, mm-hmm. Jason Tatum has to quarantine. The league is going to have to figure it out. Everyone knew there were going to be cases because they weren't going to be in a mm-hmm. bubble. But there's some talk of a plan B bubble that Silver has j- just in case things do get out of control. But mm-hmm. it is clear they're not – they're the, the rapid testing they're doing, they're not identifying who has it quick enough and or players aren't socially distancing and doing what they need to do and other people within the, the, the team staff – they're not doing what they need to do because that's essentially an outline from this starting with the Wizards and Bulls. And now you've got all these teams like Denver, I think, is affected by it and others. Yep. So I, they don't want to cancel games. I get it, you know, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think one thing that we have to delineate between these two things is um, some of this stuff is just contact tracing based. So yes. it's not that they registered a positive test. It's just because somebody responsibly said, Hey, look, I went to go meet my brother-in-law or his family or something like that. And the NBA is like, all right, look, this is the, this is the policy we have. They're not on, they're, they probably right. have like an approved list of players or approved list of people that you're allowed to go hang out with, uh, that you get to pick out and stuff like that outside your family. And then if you go outside of that, like getting a haircut from your barber or something mm-hmm. like that, then they're going to make you sit out. Um, so I think the NBA is trying to do its best job to use that contract or sorry, contact tracing mm-hmm. element as a way to, um, you know, protect the players and stuff like that. Uh, where this stuff all falls apart is when you have players who don't, who don't like care, you know, like it, it, they're just going and meeting out whoever they want. And then more importantly, they're not letting anybody know that they're doing that. Uh, and then they just show up with a positive test or they're, they, you know, obviously they high five players on the other team mm-hmm. as the game starts or something like that. Uh, and that, that ends up becoming a problem. So um, we knew that people were going to get, uh, I w- would have to sit out games. Um, we knew that that was going to happen. The NBA knew that was going to happen. The teams, the players, everybody knew that that was going to happen. Um, so there, there isn't really much to say in terms of like, oh, I told you so, because everybody knew that that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. I, I guess the main issue now is um, how does this affect competitive balance? 
because if Jason Tatum, who's a crucial member of the Boston Celtics, or if um, well, who's the, the Philly guy, uh, Joel Embiid, Embiid has to sit out 10 games, um, or, you know, even a guy like Michael Porter Jr., who's not like a main guy for the Denver, but he's a key component to their, like, their roster and stuff like that. If all these guys are sitting out two weeks at a time, how does it affect their win-loss records and stuff like that? And if anything, how do coaches, right, and coaching staffs try to balance out their rosters or the minutes on their rosters for those to, to accommodate those sort of situations without, like, overloading their best players, right? So last night, we didn't have any contact tracing issues, and Anthony Davis couldn't play. But LeBron only played 34 minutes, which is good because that's about what he averaged last season. And, you know, we've seen that the Lakers are trying to keep him between somewhere like between like 32 and 34, 30 and 33 minutes. So when we saw Jared Dudley get played yesterday, we're like, okay. At first I was like, why is Dudley getting played? I was like, I thought maybe he was playing for Kuzma, but Kuzma was on the court with him. So I was just like, why, why is Dudley getting? And then I realized, okay, this is to keep LeBron's minutes down. Yep. Like, they're not going to overstrain their guys. And that's just what, this that, that's the uniqueness of the season. This is what happens when the season when everybody was saying, "Oh, they're going into the bubble. That's not a safe environment. Cancel it." And then those same people turned around and said, "Oh no, you got to restart the season in in in, in uh, seventy days. You got to restart it on December twenty fifth. Uh, we don't care if LeBron didn't get enough rest. Like people kept doing this thing where they're like, "Oh, this is all like this is an NBA Twitter thing." Like, oh, this is just to help LeBron. This is just to help LeBron. And now you're watching your favorite team that you're rooting mm-hmm. for lose their best player because of stuff like this. Now, if we had waited until January, would this have th- these issues still arise? Probably, because we're in the middle of January. And if the season had started right now, we would still be in, like, the middle of a crazy pandemic situation, and people would still be getting, um, you know, having to sit out and stuff like that. But this is the nature of trying to operate a business that has human-to-human, you know, contact like this. Mm-hmm. And until the vaccine is a norm, uh, there's not going to be any anything that goes out of this. My main thing now at this point is, um, and I think you and I have been saying it, I don't know how much stock you can take out of the regular season. Because if you're already not, if you're already not getting time to do training with your teammates to like play live scrimmages and stuff like that, because there's no breaks, right? Because it's a condensed season. If you're not having time to do film sessions, um, if you're either traveling and you have different COVID protocols that make everything take longer and waste more time. And then on top of that, if you're missing time because of contact tracing, not because you tested positive, just contact tracing, what rhythm are any of these players going to get in that have as the season goes on? And that's the thing that I think like folks need to understand that there, this regular season is going to mean like, this is going to be almost like the most not nonsensical, but like useless regular season. You know what I mean? Like outside of maybe small habits and stuff that you see out of your players, you're not going to really know what version of your team is actually good. And we don't even know if they're going to get enough time to practice before the playoffs even start. Right. So are they going to get like two weeks to start? Like, are they going to get chances to heal up? How do you manage right. all that stuff? So it's, it's a really crazy burden. I think on the organizations, it's a crazy burden on the coaching staffs and, and the players. And I understand the players voted for this. That's how it works. They, they knew what the results of all this stuff would be. Um, or the risks and stuff like that all would be. So hats off to them because, you know, they, for us, it's entertainment um, to some degree. And for them, it's their livelihood. So I understand the case of it. But, like, I'm, I'm not I'm not surprised that teams are blow, getting blown out. And on top of that, there's no fans. So who are you playing for? Mm-hmm. Like, you're just going to empty gyms and, and playing basketball um, with all this stuff. Uh, and so – we may not see a real version, like the realest version of this Laker team until right before the playoffs start. We may not even see it until the playoffs start. That's the crazy part. And um, that's just the nature, man. That That's just the nature of this team. Uh, and that's just the nature of this season. So I, I think it sucks because, you know, as fans, we want to be able to, to watch our team and say, okay, I know for sure these five things are things that are always going to be perfect. Like, I know I can always rely on this team to do this. Mm-hmm. But the nature of this season is not going to allow that. And I think folks need to get used to that. And I think Lakers Twitter needs to get used to that uh, because a lot of folks are probably going to be like, man, we're 20 games in. And, okay, we won 16 of those games. But, well, you know, like, we don't look like the team that we were last year. Right. Well, we, we may not. We may not look like that team until the playoffs. And I don't even know if we're going to look like that in the playoffs because I don't know what's going to happen with COVID. 
I don't know if these guys are going to be healthy or, or if they'll get practice. So you just got to be patient, man, and, and, and hope that uh, everybody can stay healthy on this team. Um, we've already had dealt with our own issue with contact tracing with Alex mm-hmm. Caruso having to sit out games. He won't be the last guy. So we just have to kind of roll with it. This is going to be a really weird season, uh, but it's going to be the season that it is a very unique circumstance. I think all of that is well said and that this is what the teams and the NBA is dealing with. And this is what fans have to deal with as well. The Lakers do the first 10 games are seven and three. And I think mm-hmm. that that's a really, that that's a real positive, all things considered. And mm-hmm. I suspect that they will be a top one or two team in the West the next over the next 10 games. I, I think that they're just that good. So we will certainly be back to do a recap of the next 10 and see where things are at. Hopefully we're seeing a more dominant Anthony Davis. We're seeing guys be healthy. We're seeing KCP back. Hopefully all those things are true, but if they're not, then the Lakers have to weather the storm. And that's just the burden that they're not only they are under, but everybody else who's playing basketball mm-hmm. at this point. So Thank you guys for checking out the show. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and uh, turn on your notifications so you don't miss any of the videos. If you're listening to it on Apple, Spotify, or Google, make sure you subscribe on those platforms. And we will be back, I'm pretty sure, for a post-game. Lakers play uh, the Rockets on Sunday. or So we'll be back mm-hmm. for a pre-game and, and maybe a post-game. So, uh, guys, thank you as always for checking us out. Uh, we'll talk to you then.